This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice with me this morning as we come ready to worship and to praise. Rejoice with me this morning as we're getting ready to usher in the word and the will of God that we would honor him and praise him. Right now we're going to go to the throne of grace and I pray that you'll be praying with me as we're praying unto God to usher in the Holy Spirit for our service today. Thank you, O oh God. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord God, we come before you this morning, Lord God, submitting ourselves unto you, O oh Lord. For you are the sovereign God, the one and only true and living God. It is you, Lord God, that we love. It is you, O oh God, that we praise. It is you, O oh God, whom we give all glory to, O oh God, because you and you alone are worthy. Father, we pray during our time of worship this morning that you will begin to look upon the hearts and the minds of every person that's watching, oh God, that you will begin to bless them, oh God, by your Holy Spirit. Let your spirit, oh God, begin to minister even right now, Lord God. Touch a heart, Lord God. Touch a spirit, Lord God. Touch right now in the name of Jesus, oh God, and usher us in, oh God, into your courts with thanksgiving. Help us, oh God, to just worship you and glorify you and give you the praise. Father, we pray right now for your Holy Spirit to saturate, Lord God, the praise and worship that will come forward to cover, oh God, Pastor, as he brings forth the word. Oh Lord, we need your spirit like never before, oh God. Though we may be physically distant, oh God, our spirits are connected, oh God. And because of that, Lord God, we feel the power of your Holy Ghost in us right now. So Father, in the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit upon us, O oh God, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth as we enter into our worship service this morning. Father, anoint, touch, breathe, pour out, O oh God, upon us all that we may receive from you, O oh Lord, what you have for us today. This is our prayer unto you, O oh God, because you alone are worthy, God, and only you can do it. So God, we bless you this morning. We give you glory, honor, and praise that is due unto you and you alone. And we say hallelujah, hallelujah. Lift up your voice and just say hallelujah. Lift up your hands and praise unto the God that is the above all gods. He is the one and only true and living God. There is no other. And so we will bless the name of the Lord at all times for his praise shall continually be in our mouths and so god we bless you we honor you and praise you this in the matchless name of jesus we pray amen amen and amen mary did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. But that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. The child that you deliver. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, 
and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. We'll soon deliver you, Mary, did you because I know that all things work together for those who are called according to God's purpose. God, I've made it thus far. Thank you for life, health, and strength. Thank you for family. Thank you for the loss, for the love, for the souls that are to come. Just thankful to God that we are yet still here and there is yet still purpose in our lives. 
thanking God for every day. I'm thankful for my family, for my health, my strength, and I'm definitely thankful for having a job in this pandemic. I'm thankful for the lessons learned. I'm thankful for the love of family. And most of all, I'm thankful for grace. The grace that God gave me to make it this far and the grace he's gonna give me to keep going. I'm thankful for 2020. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for everyone else that supports me during this time that we are living in. I thank God for my family, for my health and my strength. I thank God for having a job during this pandemic. I know so many people have lost jobs during this pandemic and I just thank God for protecting my family, for covering each and every one of us. I'm thankful for health, strength, God protection and his love for my family and me. Happy holidays. Hello, New Hope, um, to all of our uh, visiting guests and friends. Uh, Pastor Senior here, excited to, uh, to continue in our series that we started on last week. Uh, we're taking this Advent season uh, as an opportunity to reflect on some clarifying thoughts in light of all that we've had to navigate in 2020. One of the things we talked about last week is how much we've come to understand how close and near we need God to be. That no matter how close you felt uh, to God on last year, uh, so many of us recognized how much closer still we need him to be. But we also shared how religion doesn't help with that. In fact, in many ways, religion makes it worse because it has a tendency to feed into our sense of self-righteousness uh, and our tendency towards self-absorption. But what we desperately need is the work and activity of the gospel, uh, that the ministry of the Lord Jesus makes it possible for us to show up for God in a way that allows God to show up in us, right? The gospel is not religion. It is God's mechanism for allowing us to come in and adore him, him. Not our rituals, but him. Today, we're going to continue our look at the first few chapters of Isaiah. Uh, Judah, the recipient of Isaiah's prophecy, had been invaded by a foreign army. Uh, their sense of security and uh, peace deeply shaken. This was for them a time of uh, real national darkness. And one of the reasons we're exploring Isaiah during this season is because there are some parallels. In many ways, this is a dark time for us. Disease, death, poverty, violence, all exacerbated by political polarization, greed, ego, fear, anger, the world's darkness is driving more and more people to do desperate things. And so we're looking at Isaiah because Isaiah offers a picture of hope, but also we can relate to the darkness that they're experiencing in the shadow of that hope. So let's look at chapter two. And as we're looking at chapter two, there are three major keys that I'd like to deposit with you today. The first is a reason for optimism. The second is the real obstacle. And then finally, the only option. So let's first talk about 
a, re, a reason for optimism. As we look at Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, we see Isaiah describing uh, a very um, uh, uplifting moment in the National uh, Archive. He says, all the nations streaming to the Lord's temple, uh, there to avail themselves of his teaching, to learn his ways that we might walk his paths. Isaiah is envisioning, he, he's seen a day where uh, a day is coming when the nations will stream in to Jerusalem, not to attack. And remember verse one, he's just talking about the invasion, but he says, there's coming a day when people and nations will stream into Jerusalem, not to attack, but to worship and learn, right? That they will be so impressed with God and the people of God that they will show up to learn more of God, to study at his feet. Then verse four, he talks about how God will mediate between nations and will settle disputes for many peoples and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I love the uh, some of the old songs uh, uh, that the saints used to sing about not learning uh, that day, singing about this day that Isaiah envisions where we won't have to study war no more. Isaiah says that not only will people stream into Jerusalem to learn from God, but somehow their relationship will, with God will take away the hostility they have toward one another and they will begin the work of transforming their tools used to maim and kill into instruments to help and heal. That, that society will shift from focusing on destructive measures to exclusively productive ones. Now, what a beautiful vision for the future. And so maybe your question is like mine, when Isaiah can we anticipate that future event? Well, there are different scholars that have different views on this. There are some who believe that what Isaiah is reflecting on is, is heaven, eternity, uh, right? Um, the new heaven and the new earth uh, that John talks about in the book of Revelation. There are others who believe that Isaiah is talking about a millennial period when Jesus returns uh, and for that seven year period when he reigns, uh, Isaiah is, they believe is painting a picture uh, of that time of peace and prosperity. And still yet another group believes that what Isaiah is talking about could easily happen right now if the world and the nations would simply turn to God in Christ by faith. Whichever view or track one might believe is true, the implications for us all is the same. And we see that in verse number five. Come descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Whether you and I believe that this vision that Isaiah has of peace and prosperity is related to some uh, distant future uh, kingdom of God established by Christ, or you believe that it's something that can happen right now in our lifetime, what Isaiah's answer is, is yes, that God is able to do and he will do these things. And so his admonition to the people and, and really a word for us now is live that way, right? Live your life in the full confidence that God is at some point going to reconcile the world to himself and, and create the kind of society where people will bend their swords 
are, are, are their weapons of mass destruction, that they will take their technology used to tear and to maim and use those things to help and to heal. But in the interim, Isaiah says, let us live our walk in the light of the Lord, right? Love God and trust God, right? Love God, love and trust God. Love and serve others, right? This, these are the kinds of themes that Isaiah is dealing with, right? To walk in the light, to love and to trust God, to love and to serve others. Walk in the light. Why? Because God says, I want to bless you with peace. But there's an obstacle, right? There's the optimism, but then there's an obstacle. Chapter two starts off great, and then now it finishes grim. Look at verse six. Isaiah describes a society that is spiritually troubled. They're dabbling in other religions. They've accumulated uh, lots of wealth. They've amassed a huge military. And Isaiah says, as the result of that, they are now uh, starting to trust their stuff more than they're trusting God, right? That they have, these things have essentially become idols. Whatever we look to or whomever we look to to meet our deepest needs, that functionally becomes our God. So Isaiah says that the problem the obstacle is that they have chosen us over him. Well, why would they do that? Why would, if, if, if all God wants to do is to bless them with peace, then why would they reject that for something lesser? Well, verse 11 gives the diagnosis. It's the source of, for their spiritual illness. And the word that's used is arrogance. That they, they simply are arrogant. They're prideful. And what God wants them to know is that it's not going to work. It, it just, it never works. That when we put our trust in people and things, when we look to people and things, to meet our deepest needs, they always fall short. I mean, you think about it. Just, just think about our country right now. We have more guns, more money, and more options, maybe than we've ever had in history. And yet we are more afraid, we're more insecure, and we're more confused. Why? Again, Isaiah tells us in the text, he says, the eyes of the arrogant will be humbled and human pride brought low. Beloved, let me say it again. Whenever we put our trust in people and things to meet our deepest needs, they always fall short and it always leaves us hanging. And so Isaiah's invitation to them is come, let us adore him, not our religion and our rituals, not our ego and our human pride, but let us adore him because he longs to bless us with peace. But the thing that we need for peace namely trusting him, is being blocked by our pride. And we see this, right? I, I mean, I, you know, you hearing this from me is, is not shocking. We see an increasing number of people buying into the notion that we're good without God. But but to believe that is, is to ignore the arc of human history. 
Erasing God doesn't account for the human traits that have been the source of every atrocity known to mankind. Erasing God still doesn't address the issue of pride, greed, envy, jealousy, wrath, lust. And so many of these philosophical conversations that we've been, that we have uh, in an attempt to undermine our need for God ignores the real tragedy of human frailty. I mean, we jump through all kinds of hoops in order to avoid the person in the mirror. I mean, like right now, you know, the, the kind of the, 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 I guess the hot thing, and maybe it's always been a thing, uh, but where people demonize institutions, you know, whether it's teachers or, uh, or police officers or, uh, or churches uh, or caseworkers, all right, right, that, the, that, that we look at these institutions and agencies as others or we try to classify them as others. And a part of that is because it allows us to see the issues as being other and not us. But let's, let's zoom in, right? Right now we've been talking about global issues, but, but even think about your own view of life and how you personally are navigating life. What are the most important elements for your combating and overcoming the areas of darkness in your life? What about in your family or your marriage or your job? Is it your education? Is it your personal effort and ingenuity? Is it your network of friends? Or can you say that on many levels, one of the things that you are most reliant upon is God showing up, him being near and close. And in the same way that you and I need him in these spaces with us on an individual level, we also need him present in these corporate communal spaces. And what Isaiah wants the people to understand, and certainly what you and I have to grapple with, is that it ultimately is going to be one or the other. Either we are depending exclusively on our human ability, right, to fix and to solve these things, or we're relying on God. Now, the people of Judah, they had experienced enough success They'd accumulated enough prosperity that they had kind of become, you know, reliant heavily on their human ability. They were the ultimate humanist. But now they're seeing the consequences. Invasion. They're shaking security. And now the onset of darkness. But Isaiah wants them to know that there's another option. In fact, I want to suggest to you today that it's the only option. If you look at verse 22, Isaiah says to them, stop trusting in mere humans who have but a breath in their nostrils. Why hold them in esteem? If you look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse five, the prophet Jeremiah says it even more succinctly and sharply. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from God. That so many of the issues that we see consistently appear in society 
not just this generation, but in others, is that our ability to give is dependent on the ability of others. Our ability to give is dependent on uh, our ability to get from others. And so when there's a log jam in that regard, then that's when love becomes constipated. Patience, goodness. The atmosphere around us is filled with disappointment and frustration. Because remember, when God is not properly enthroned, then we enthrone other lesser gods and they always disappoint, which leads to an atmosphere of disappointment and frustration. We look to systems and things and people and groups to fill spaces and voids that only God can fill. And as a result, we, we have unrealistic expectations because again, we're lifting up people and things to be what they can't be, and that is God. I was uh, reading once about a pastor uh, who was sharing a story of, of, of a conversation that he had with a, a, a young woman that attended his church uh, who'd gone through uh, a period of darkness. It was relational darkness. She had a a long history of bad relationships with men. So she started working with a therapist to try and, um, and, and address this issue in her life. One of the things that this, the therapist suggested that she needed to focus on was continuing to work on her education, getting a good job, and focusing on her career. What the young woman said to her pastor was, I, I know that she meant well, and certainly the things that she pointed out are true. Like, I, I, I know I need to work on my education. I, I know I want to advance in my career. But I also know that I don't want to be as enslaved to my work as I was to men. And she said, and I want to quote, looking, look, looking at men... Uh, I always had this thought that unless I have love, I am nothing. And I don't want to trade that for unless I am successful, I am nothing. I don't want to go from typical female idols for a typical male idol. I don't want either. Well, of course, the pastor was intrigued, so he said, well, well, how are you managing it? What are, what are you doing? What, what then is, what is the other? She says, well, when I, I look at men, I, I'm glad to, I think to myself, I'm glad to know you, but you are not my life. Christ is my life. I'm done making anything else my life save him. She went on to say, a career can't die for me. If I fail in my career, that will beat me up all my life. But when I fail Jesus, he lifts me up in his life. There is another option, Judah. I would argue the only option. And so what 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 I what what Isaiah says to them again, going back to verse five, is he tells them, resolve to walk in the light. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let our confidence in the Lord be so great and run so deep that we allow Jesus to guide the way that we think about how we share our light in the world. Again, I wanna read from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses seven and eight. 
And when he says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is in the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heats come. But its leaves will be green and, will, and it will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. That when you and I persist in the light, right, that we love God, we love and trust God. That Jeremiah says we are very much like a tree planted in the right spot. Right next to the water, right next to the resource, right next to the supply. So that whatever is going on in the conditions around us, when the heat comes, that we still stand planted, rooted in the supply. When the dry seasons come, we are still rooted planted in the supply. We can't get that from any other source, putting our trust in people and things to meet our deepest needs. But when we are planted in the source, then it means that our inner security and our strength are dependent on him who is totally faithful. That even when others don't have it to give, because we are receiving from an endless supply, we never run dry. Our life is filled with an atmosphere of blessing and satisfaction and optimism because our future hope doesn't rest in people and things but it rests in him who is timeless and eternal. So we share, we serve, we lead because our confidence is in the Lord. Not in our abilities, not in our connections, not in our skill. I, I love you. I, I love my family. I love my friends. I, I, I believe in community. But I also understand how fickle all of those things can be. And so my ultimate trust is in the Lord. Because it's the light of Christ that we celebrate. Especially, I think now, is a good time to reflect. It's what we celebrate at Advent. It's what puts the Christ in Christmas. That we adore Him. Watch this. We love everyone. We adore Him. to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to, to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power world without end. Amen. We love you. Merry Christmas.